Welcome to 2017. The new year has begun, and today is a fresh start. Extremely fresh if you drank too much coffee, such as myself. Uh, <laughs> but uh, welcome. Uh, today is a new day of new beginnings, new dreams, new goals, new events, and new hopes. But most importantly, I hope it is a fresh start to our hearts and lives of faith with God. With each new year brings the first new day. But what will your new day be? What will begin the threshold of a new year for you? Will it be joy or will it just be another day? Will it be hope for the future? Will it be a resetting of goals and dreams or just a resettling for what is and not what could be? Today I want to bring thoughts of hope and promise to you for a new year. I want to remind you on this new day of the new covenant that God made with us. And I want to remind you of the new creation God has made you to be. I want to point you to the new possibilities that God could do in your life if you are daring enough to dream on this new day. <laughs> Recently, I saw a video of a husband and wife who had been married for 40 years. And every year, they described that they set new resolutions in their marriage and in their personal lives. So the husband started off by saying, this year I resolve to not do these silly resolutions anymore. <laughs> and then his wife said, I resolve to stop holding my husband to this unfair expectation that he should go to the gym every single week. Though I want him to, and he probably should, but I, I, I resolve to not hold him to that anymore. And she had this look in, in her face, kind of sheepishly, like he should be going to the gym. So her husband said back, well, I have, I have back problems. I, I, I can't go to the gym. And she said, well, that doesn't get you out of every task that you have to do in this house. And uh, so he came back with another resolve. I resolve to stop making my wife believe that everyone likes her cooking. <laughs> so his wife, Betty, said, I resolve to let my husband be his own man, and I'm going to start by letting him do his own cooking. <laughs> so the husband said back, but honey, I, I love your cooking. <laughs> and she said, well, I thought you said no one likes my cooking. And, and so he replied, well, yeah, all of our guests and no one else likes your cooking, but I love your cooking. At the end of the whole story and, and watching them make their resolves and kind of banter back and forth, they said, I resolve to love you one more year and to continue to love you. Sometimes our resolutions can be simple and sometimes they can be big. And I think each new year brings about an opportunity for new things to start our lives. Long ago, God created this world in his love, in his joy, in his peace. He wanted to create a place where he could share his love to bring opportunities and joys and risks as well. However, Creation didn't go as it had planned or as God had hoped with the fall of Adam and Eve and the people that he loved. When man fell, God realized he had to make a different plan. In some ways, you could say a resolution or a resolve. In Genesis 3.15, we find this resolve. For it says that through woman's seed, a savior would come that would crush the serpent. The Hebrew word that is given there for seed is not a plural word, but more of a singular word. That one seed would come that would crush the serpent, yet the serpent would strike his heel. This was the foretelling 
in a prophetic way that one would come that would have to redeem the world back to God. So, as the world waited in anticipation for the redemption of the creation that God had made, the one who would come to redeem was Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, because Jesus came to redeem what had been lost. In his perfect love, when God created, he allowed the possibility of sin to enter the world. Because we could ask, why would God create a world where sin could possibly enter in? Couldn't he create something where there was no chance that sin would be allowed in? Yet for the depth of his love to reach its fullness, God allowed the possibility of sin because he wanted a people who would willingly choose to love him or choose not to love him, to choose to follow his words or not follow his words. Like any loving parent, how many parents do we have in the room? Go ahead and raise your hand. So we got a few parents. Okay. Like any loving parent from the time your child is born, do you ever stop loving your child? Do you ever give up? on your children. I think in the same way, God chose to never give up on his children, no matter what would happen. And the children could choose to love and obey God or reject and leave God. And we know that true love also follows commands. God's commands are based on his everlasting truth because God is love and God is truth. And to follow his commands is to love God. As it says in 1 John, But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And so the light of the world was born into the world to come and redeem the creation that he loved and had lost. God's love is so big that through the giving and laying down of Christ's life, could the creation be brought back into that perfect unity? And God's plan was to make creation new once again through forgiveness and redemption. So let's go back to that starry night, the night that we just celebrated, the night that Jesus was born. The cattle were lowing and the sheep were grazing and the shepherds came to see Christ the child. Jesus was born and I could imagine at that moment, Mary and Joseph said, now what? What do you do when you've just brought the Son of God into the world and now you're going to raise the Son of God? I could imagine Joseph had to think, this is going to be a challenging task. I mean, how do I, how do I be a dad to the Son of God? Imagine what it could have been like. So they're in their carpentry shop, right? Think of the times maybe you were with your children teaching them things. And, and there's Joseph and Jesus, and, and they're building something. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says something to the effect of, wow, you know, if we, if we build this structure like this, and, and we could build it so tall, it'll be like the skyscrapers that are going to come one day. And, and then Joseph looks at him and says, well, what are you talking about, Jesus? And he says, oh, don't worry, Dad. That's coming in another couple thousand years. I'm, it's, it's too hard to explain. Well, I, I could imagine what would happen if you had moments like that, fathering the Son of God. Well, whatever the case, however we could imagine that Jesus was raised, we do know certain things did happen when Jesus was born. The days that followed would be as Jewish law described. On the eighth day, every child was taken to the temple of God, and every firstborn was an offering to God, as prescribed in Exodus chapter 13. The mother and father would buy their son back and offer an animal sacrifice in his place. Their experience at the temple would point Mary and Jesus, or Mary and Joseph, back to the promise given to them by God through the angel Gabriel. For the, in the temple was a man, a prophet, whom God had promised that he would see Christ the child before he had died. 
as it says, Simeon took Jesus in his arms and said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Simeon was waiting to see the new covenant that God had promised in the law and the prophets. See, this was spoken about for years and years and years in Israel's history, that the redemption would come, that one would rise up in the line of David to redeem Israel and to bring glory to God. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God is doing a new thing. He started it then, and he's still doing a new thing to this day. As it was also prophesied in Isaiah 43, 19, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. No longer would the law of God be read or only read, but now it would be written on the hearts and minds of the people whom God loved. He furthered the depth of this covenantal relationship by pouring his spirit by pouring himself out into our hearts to transform how we live and breathe every single day. God sought in his marital and covenantal relationship to wash his bride white as snow and to put his love and redeeming heart within them. This brings us into a new creation that you and I have been made through the blood of Jesus Christ, into a new creation, that the new has come. You and I are no longer who we used to be. Jesus has transformed and changed our hearts. As it speaks about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, our reading for today, that we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We are filled with the love of God, the Spirit of God, who guides us every single day. It's a new day. It's a new and start fresh. I remember the covenant that God made with me. Do you remember this in your hearts? Do you carry this new covenant every day? Today is a day to be filled with the winds of the Spirit of God and to take hold of the promises that we have in Christ. You are a new creation. You have been given the message of reconciliation. You are an ambassador for Christ. You have been called to walk in newness, to walk in light, to walk in purity, to walk in wholeness, and to walk in holiness. Now I ask a question with that, do you feel new? Do you feel that each day is a new day that God has birthed within your heart? And do you find joy and excitement in Christ Jesus, the one who loves us? And I'm not saying that life is perfect. There's a lot of imperfections in this world. And imperfections and challenges come. But I believe that God has given us a new promise and a new hope to hold to guide our hearts through any and every situation. That he has given us something not to be overcome by the world, but that we overcome the world through Christ Jesus. Something that has been written deep within our hearts, treasures found in jars of clay. As it says in the chapter before in 2 Corinthians, we have this treasure in jars of clay 
to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Today is a new day to walk with our hearts full of treasure, jars of clay. It's a new day to gird the cross upon us and walk in this newness of life, the depths and riches and glory of the light and life of Jesus Christ, the salvation that has come. I think sometimes it can be hard to see Christ in our daily lives. Sometimes I think we also hold on to the old days that were before us. We stay in the old day, which may be the past, the challenges and struggles that we faced, instead of reaching forward to the joy and the new opportunities that God gives us. We hold on to past pain, Memories come up again, barriers that hold us back. They may come back in innocence, they may come back in anger, some through grief and trials, while others are temptations, doubts, disbeliefs, fears, or insecurities. I want to tell you that today, on this new day, you were not meant to live in the old day. Christ redeemed the old day, for the new day to come and to free your heart. Sometimes you just got to lay it back down. Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive that situation and bring newness and healing to my heart again. My hope and prayer is that you do not hold on to that old day, but rather you step forward into the new day that Christ has called the new day that he is bringing, because light has dawned. Now is the day of your salvation, as it speaks of in 2 Corinthians, starting in chapter 6. Today is the day of your salvation. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, right now is the day of salvation. And so we are to take hold of that day. Take hold of the salvation found in Christ. Find freedom in your hearts once again because it is here being held out for you. 2017 has just begun. What new possibilities could God bring to you and your life this year? What new goals and new dreams, new hopes are within your heart? What could God do through you on a new day, whether it be discipling others, reaching out to a friend, opening doors that have been closed, that you closed, not that God closed. Maybe it's fulfilling dreams that have been placed in your heart for years, and that this year is the year to fulfill that. And so I ask, go... I don't ask, I say actually, to go to God. Take these dreams, these hopes to God in prayer and see what could he do because it's a new day and I believe the door is open because salvation has come and the light of the world is here. So within your hearts, may God bring you great joy and hope and peace in his presence for 2017. Amen.